Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate your life to the next level. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. And, and let, me, let me be honest with you. I just couldn't help but reminisce of when we first started to Elevate Church. This, this, this church, particularly in this city, was not the easiest church to get off the ground. It was challenging. I mean, you want to talk about obstacles. Now, anything you're going to do great in life, I mean, if you want to be average, then, then just be normal. But how many know that God doesn't call people to be normal? God calls you to be abnormal. God calls you to be different. God, God created you to be unique, and he said, I fearfully and wonderfully made you. And so that means that there's only one of you, and you have to be the best you that God called you to be, right? And so when we started Elevate Church, I mean, it was hard. But, I mean... To, to just convince people to follow us, to convince people that God wants to expand us, to convince people that God wants to reach this city, to convince people that God wants to do something fresh and new in the city of Newhall. It was like, my Lord. It's like being on a team. You know, you ever watch basketball, you're on a team, and, and each team, man, they, they all get past the ball, right? Get ready to catch us. I don't want to hit your face. They pass the ball, pass it back, boom, and every, everyone's playing, and then they pass the ball here. You want to catch? Boom boom right pass it back i mean we're all we're all we're all in this together right we're dribbling together we're passing together and we all have one goal and the goal is to make that net right there we want to get this little round thing inside that round circle net that's the aim that's the goal but we would throw the ball to people and it'd be like this like okay how about you okay maybe you'll help us and it was this constant battle of people not wanting to expand and 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 to reach and to and to grow and to change and how many know that that is still the same issue in the body of Christ there are so many people that have so much potential to be so incredibly amazing because God created you to be unique because God created you to be different because God created you to stand out and be separated for his holy purposes but there are too many people that are sitting in churches all over the world that are just sitting down and not getting in the game do you guys hear what i'm saying and we got to change that and of course we see the fruit of our labor the fruit of so many people that said yes along the way there were people that that did not want to play but eventually, players started coming in and saying, here, man, I got you. And they dribbled the ball. And then another one showed. And before you knew it, you see what's been happening here nine years later. And it's been, um, it's been a brutal thing. It's been brutal but beautiful. And uh, it's been awesome. And I love to see. But how many know that it all starts with your mindset? Everybody say mind. Listen, you won't change until you change this mind. This mind right now is what's giving you what you have or what you don't have right now the only limitation that you and i have is the way we are thinking right now you're either thinking to become everything god has called you to become or you're hardly thinking about anything and either way you're thinking so you might as well go ahead and be positive and take on the mind of christ and start asking yourself you know what what do i want to accomplish this year it's you know what's the church i want to see and i started telling them the church i see and and i started telling them you know i see a church that's passionate about god i see a church that doesn't hold back i see a church that's bold that's courageous i see a church that is not afraid to answer the call of god i see a church that's not afraid of not only local missions but global missions i see a church that is passionate about worship passionate about serving passionate about changing lives i see a church that is generous i see a church that is willing to do anything everything or nothing at all and you start talking like this let me tell you something that just kind of puts an extra step inside of you but you can do that about yourself what kind of La Carlos do you see what kind of Lexi do you see what do you see what kind of Elliot do you see 
Do you see an Elliot that's struggling, that's challenged? Do you see a LaCarlos that's, that's not making it, that's tired all the time? Or do you see a person that is, that is progressing, that is pushing, that is fighting the good fight of faith, that is reaching for the stars, that is, that is stepping out and taking risks for Almighty God? What do you see in you? Are you hearing me? I want Jesus to say, what madness is this in a positive way? Like, man, you're so crazy in your faith. What is wrong with you? You know what I'm saying? In a good way. Because that's how God created us. And so real quickly, um, I want all of us to think, how can we be better? And so there's three types of people in the church. And, and hopefully you find yourself in one of them. Real quickly, Matthew 25, verse 24 through 30, it says this. It says, then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Okay, mind you, this is Jesus teaching his team. Everybody say team. So this is Jesus. He's at halftime. And he's the coach, and he's talking to team disciples. And he's going over some things. And he says, okay, let me give you guys an illustration to kind of, you know, be in the locker room with you right now. And we're at halftime. And let me just tell you what a winning team looks like. Let me tell you what an exceptional team looks like. And he says, uh, so then the man who had received one bag of gold came and He said, Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was what? Afraid. And I went out and I hid your gold in the ground. See, here it is. Here's what belongs to you. And his master replied to him and said what? He said, you wicked and what? Lazy servant. You knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well, then you should have put my money, my money on deposit with the banks so that when I return, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has 10 bags for whoever has will be given more for whoever has will be given more. How many want just a little bit more? Not, nobody. Okay. <laughs> All right. Then give it to me. Okay. Let me say that again. How many want just a little bit more? Yeah. Right? A little bit more. A little bit more joy. How about a little bit more peace? How about, how about a little bit more finances to not only provide for you, but to be a blessing to someone else's life? Right? So a little bit more. Just a little bit more. He says, so give it to the guy who has a little bit more. For whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. How many want the abundance of God? I'm not preaching to you a prosperity message, okay? I'm preaching to you a message that God says, I want to give you the abundant life. And whoever does not have even what they have will be taken from them. And throw what, and look at, listen to this, I, I like this. And throw that worthless servant outside, dang, that's harsh, into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Let me give you the picture, the whole picture of the story. So uh, there's three guys. So God gives us one guy. He gives one talent. The other guy gives two talents. The other guy gives five talents. And he says, Jesus is telling, okay, so this master gave them some work to do. He gave them some, some. I mean, he gave them a, a, a talent. He gave them something to start with. And how many know that God has given every single one of you skill, something to start with? But how many know that you are responsible now how to multiply that skill? to multiply that talent to multiply your giftings that is your responsibility god has given us the 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 capacity to have intelligence now your job is to expand that intelligence god has given you the capacity to to increase in finances but now you have the responsibility to multiply them so you have these three guys and and the guy with the two talents he goes and he starts working hard and not hardly working right and he's working it and he goes ahead and he multiplies it and he you know gathers an interest of what he had to begin with the other guy that had five man he started working that at five according to and mind you jesus will only give you according to your ability according to your according to what you can do that means that every single one of us have the ability for something and so the guy with the five he multiplied it but the guy with the one you know what i'm saying here's the problem he was mediocre he was normal He started thinking, you know, you heard the story. I was afraid because I heard how hard you are. 
And it's like the boss is like, dude, you knew how hard I was and you still didn't have the, the audacity. You still didn't have the courage to do something with what I gave you. I mean, here you have Jesus telling a story about a boss who has a team and he's telling this team, let's progress. Let's, 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 let's reach further. Let's do more. And this guy just decides, you know what, uh, I'm just going to go ahead and bury this. I'm going to go ahead and just put it away. And when he comes back, I'll just tell him, look, here, boss, here's everything you gave me. I'm giving it right back to you. But the boss is like, no. Do you realize that's what God is saying about you and I? Do you realize that God has put some amazing potential inside your life? And God doesn't want you to bury that potential. God doesn't want you to bury that skill set. God doesn't want you to bury that talent. Every single one of you have the capacity to do something great on this earth for God Almighty. And when you and I reach heaven, when you and I stand before God, God's not going to look at all the houses you bought, the cars, the, the, the bank accounts. That's not what God's talking about. God's talking about what interest did your life, what worth, what value did your life give to other people? Why? He says, throw this worthless servant out. He wasn't talking about money. He was talking about, do you even see the worth in your life? My life, your life is to bring worth to the people that are around you. Your job is to bring value to whatever people that God brings into your life. That is our God responsibility. As a team, listen, a team can only be as great as their other team players. There's no such thing as a hero without a team. There is no such thing as a great anything without a team. It takes a team to make the dream happen. It takes a team of people to surround you, to pray for you, to help you, to stir you up, to challenge you. I thank God that we have wonderful people at Elevate Church that stir up the gifts within every single one of us to be better at what we do. And that's what God wants for every single one of you. We have to be Team Jesus, but we have to, we have to not be normal. God's not calling us to be mediocre. And how many of that's the temptation? The temptation that every single one of us have is to be normal people, to be average people, to be okay people. No, God wants us to to expand God wants us to increase uh, this guy was so afraid that he said well everybody said that you know what uh, this guy's harsh so I, there was a just just put it away you'll be good man and just give it back to him and it'll all be good but but God was like no th this is not going to work for me and today we live in a society where mediocrity is the normal today have you noticed we live in a society where mediocrity is normal people are okay with norm is your name Norm? It's not okay to be Norm. It's, 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 it's not God to be Norm. If you're a Christ follower, you are abnormal. There should be something different about you. There should be something that sets, separates you apart from normality in our life. And, 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 and the problem is that we have so many people that do as little as they can to get by. You have so many people that just do just the minimum that's required so that they don't get fired. They do the minimum that's required so that they don't cause any waves in the, in the office, right? They do as little as possible so that the boss doesn't even know you exist. But God wants you to stand out, not fit in. There's too many fit-ins. There's too many copycats. God created an original in you. That's how God created you. And so there's people that don't take pride in their work. Now, there's healthy pride and then there's ugly pride. Man, I'm talking about like, man, whatever it is that God has given you to do, take pride in it. Man, take, take this, this, this sense of like, I love what my hands is creating. I love what my ideas are, are creating. I love what my team is developing. Like, take pride. I don't care if you clean houses. Take pride in cleaning houses. I don't, if you're someone that's, that's, in, that's a CEO or, or you're someone in management or you're someone that's an employee, take pride in whatever it is you do. Maybe your job is to put the little, you know, that little uh, 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 cap on the toothpaste. Take pride in how you put that cap on that toothpaste because that's what sets you apart. Take pride. Take pride in what you do for a living. Take pride in who you are. 
Like really, like don't be prideful, but take pride that, man, I love Jesus. Take pride that I'm set apart for Jesus. Take pride that I work differently than the rest of the people. I'm not better than people. I'm exceptional. Amen? Amen. I mean, because here's the deal. I know if somebody's watching people work, I mean, I'm sure they perform at their best. But see, it's not about when you're being watched. It's about when nobody's watching you. What kind of player are you? Are you still playing in the game or are you hardly playing? And that's why, that's why there's more than half of society that is unsatisfied. That's why there's more than half of our society that's unhappy. I mean, li listen, the average person hates what they do for a living. But they'll stick it out just to make a paycheck. There's no pride in that. That's goofy. And then they wonder why, why they can't accelerate, why they can't, because they, they just, there's, there's no happiness. There's, there's, it's, they're unsatisfied. That's why there's so much divorce, because there's so much unsatisfaction when we don't take pride in stuff. That's why there's so many people that just are addicted to stuff because there's just no pride in what we do. And how many believe God that God did not call you to live a normal life? Do you really believe that honestly? Because I'm here today like to play coach. I want to play coach and tell Elevate Church, come on, God didn't call you to be normal. God did not call this church to be normal. God didn't call your family to be normal. God didn't call your kids to be normal. God has called us to be unique, to be special, to be set apart, to be different. To stand out where people say, man, there's something different about you. Normal, the problem with normal, normal is in abundance everywhere. It, normal is glorified in our society. It's, it's really, it's, it's a challenge. But how many know that God wants us to glorify him? And the best way you can glorify God is through your life. That's the best way you can glorify him. You know, how you work, how you live, how you talk, that glorifies him. Let me show you a verse here in John 10.10. 10. And I love this because this is Jesus' words. He says, a thief has only one thing in mind. I never say one thing in mind. <laughs> See, you know what that tells me? That you can be the thief of your own life. You can literally be robbing yourself of the dream that God placed in you. You can be the very thief that keeps talking yourself out of God's promise. You can be the thief that keeps telling you that you're not worthy, that you're not good enough, and that you'll never mount up to anything. And so there's that idea of a thief. But Jesus is obviously talking about our opponent, and his name is Satan. He says the thief has only one thing in mind. He wants to steal. Come on, he wants to steal your dream. He wants to slaughter your life. And he comes to destroy anything you put your hands to. That's why there's so much apathy in the body of Christ. That's why there's just so much just uh, uh, mediocrity. There's so much uh, this lack of drive and passion for Jesus. And you know why? Because the, any little bit that you get from God, the enemy comes and he takes it from you. He wants to steal it from you. You hear a message in here right now that by the time you walk out and you get in your car, you'll pr probably forget like 80% of what I said today. Why? Because you have to have a plan. So that nothing gets stolen from you again and say, you know what, I'm going to be the greatest note taker. That's why we do notes on, on our Elevate app. Uh, because we want you to retain, retain, retain. But he says this, he says, but I have come, this is Jesus. He says, but I have come to give you everything in what? Abundance. Come on, I don't know if you don't want God's abundance, but God wants to give you everything. Everything. That means everything. Money, abundance. Peace, abundance. Joy, abundance. Relationships, in abundance. Come on. He wants you to be like someone that loves what they do in abundance. And he says, I have come to give you everything in abundance more than you what? Expect. In other words, God says, listen, Jesus said this to his disciples. If someone compels you to go one mile, he says, be a, be a two miler. In other words, don't just do what you're asked to do. And someone who is exceptional goes the extra mile. You go, you go further. If someone tells you, hey, listen, I want you to paint this wall, and I want you to just make it look good. Man, you not only paint the wall, you paint the trim, right? You put a little, you know, table, a flower. You go the extra mile, but I, you don't see that anymore. 
I mean, we're talking about March Madness, right? You want to you wanna live exceptional? That's madness. That's the kind of madness we want to live. And he says, but I have come to give them everything in abundance more than you expect. Life in its fullness until you overflow. Come on, I want to overflow in my leadership. I want to overflow in my love. I want to overflow in my creativity. I want to overflow in everything I do. Do you want to overflow? That's Jesus right there telling you. I mean, because if you want to have an average child, live your hand if you want to have an average kid. I don't think so. Who wants to have an average income? An average home? An average car that barely gets you here? Huh? Who wants to have an average job? Most of us accept an average job. An average church. Anybody like coming to an average church? No, heck no. Man, we don't make this church average. This church is abnormal. It's different. Man, you always hear people say, man, that church is just way too challenging. Yeah, because we're not normal. We will make you feel uncomfortable up in this place. We'll get up in your grill. And if you don't have a grill, we pray for a grill to come out. (laughs) I mean, why wouldn't you want to be exceptional? Why wouldn't you want to be an exceptional church? Why wouldn't you want to be an exceptional individual? Why wouldn't you want to be exceptional, period? What's exceptional mean? Real quick definition. It means unusual. It means uncommon. Come on, I need some uncommon people in the house of God. Come on, some uncommon, some unusual, some abnormal people in the church, right, that just think different, talk different. Like we we have a, a language of faith. And we say, we can do this, right? We can take this. We can accomplish this. And let me tell you something. When you have that spirit in this house, it prophesies to your house. Extraordinary, huh? I'll I'll give you another definition of exceptional. Exceptional, let's get rid of the uh, chanel and just put the accept. And so here's what it looks like. You know, my family, uh, they don't like going to church except me. You know, my friends, (laughs) uh, man, we're all grown already. We're all in our 30s already, okay? They all party hard, and they're always pounding it except me. At work, man, all the all the employees, man, when the boss is there, everybody works hard. When the boss is gone, everybody plays except me. See, exceptional is what you do, what others constantly do and have really bad results. You do everything except what doesn't bring glory to God. I'm an exceptional person. I'm an unusual person. All my friends still party except me. All my co-workers hardly work except me. My family doesn't serve God except me. And that's a whole other level of living. And Jesus is calling you and I to be different. Look at your neighbor and say, you got to be different. you got to be out of the ordinary, guys. Out of the ordinary. Just different. Be an uncommon person. There are too many copycats out there. We got to stop, like, stop looking like everybody. You know what I'm saying? Like, just man, change your hair. You know what I'm saying? Just, <laughs> you know, just, just different. Yeah. yeah let, let me give you this point. Because I know that, that if you want to be exceptional, you got to find what irritates you. If you want to if you want to be an exceptional leader, if you want to be an exceptional person, you got to find what what irritates you. Um, let me give you a point. What bothers us is often an indicator of what God calls us into. I'm going to say that again. What bothers us is often an indicator of what God calls us into. In other words, you have to find what what ticks you off. For example, one of the biggest things that tick me off about church is people with a poverty mentality not just poverty like you're poor okay because jesus said the poor will always be with you okay so it ain't even about you know your your economic status but even then how many know that you can be a christian and be poor in spirit like you can be so poor in spirit like there's no there's no passion there, there's no drive. There's no goal. There's, you just kind of live every day and just kind of like whatever. Like, there's no aim. 
There's no, there's no direction. Where are we going with this family? Where are we going with this life? What are we doing? You know, what's the person I see? It, and, and it just, it irritates me. And especially, you know, coming to the city of New Hall when we first started, of course, it's different now. But man, I'll tell you, it used to tick me off. But I realized this, that God calls you to the thing that ticks you off the most. And poverty, man, I just kept like literally confronting minds and hearts and like stop thinking like that. Come on, you're better than that. And seeing the potential, like come on, stop complaining. Stop being a whiner. Come on. I know that Jesus can turn water into wine, but he can't turn a whiner into anything. So stop it. My God, Padre Nuestro que estás en el cielo, please. Yeah, change already, will you? Help me, Lord. How many more times are we going to fight and argue about the same Goofy thing. Well, I don't like when they move that pulpit there. I'm going to stop. You know, it's just you're confronting this poverty mindset. And you know why? Now I know why God has called us to so many impoverished places in thinking. Because God says, I can use you to change minds in Oaxaca, in Tennessee, in Morelia, in every single place God sends us. We come to confront minds. Amen. Because listen, you are what you think. You are what you think. Look at your neighbor and say, you are what you're thinking right now. Look at the other person next to you and say, what ticks you off? And tell them, now fix it. Yeah, so, so what happened is at, at, right here in New Hall, I started becoming aware of, of the people in our city, I started realizing that this city is normal. This city is average. Man, there's a pattern of losing in the city of New Hall, and I got to change this pattern. Some of you right now, the reason you're not progressing is because you have a habit that has kept you in the same pattern for so long, and God's saying, let's break the pattern. Let's break the mold. Let's break the conforming to the spirit of this world. And let's renew the way we think. As a matter of fact, let's read that verse right now. Romans 12, 2. And I'm going to read it in two different translations. Uh, uh, Romans 12, 2 in the nerve version. It says, don't live the way this world lives. Let your way of thinking be completely changed. Everybody say completely changed. And, and here's, here's the honest to God truth. There are still people on this team and on every team in every church that have not completely changed. They haven't. They, they may have the same attitude. They may have the, the same perception. Uh, they just haven't completely changed. There's some areas that just, they just refuse to change. But look what he says. He says, then when you, when you finally decide to completely change, then you will be able to test what God wants for you. Huh? Come on, have you taken, have you taken your call for a test drive? See, until you change, you'll never step into the car God has for you. You'll never step into the will that God has for you. Why? Because you're not willing to completely change. You have changed, but you haven't completely changed. There has been some effort, but God doesn't just want effort. God wants complete change. Is that good? And so he says, then you'll be able to test what God wants for you, and you will agree that what what he wants is right, and his plan is good, and his plan is pleasing, and his plan is perfect. But we have to come to that place where we go ahead and we say, okay, God, I'm ready to completely change that little area of my life because, Lord, I know it ain't helping me. It's not helping me. Romans 12, 2 says this. It says, don't become so well-adjusted to your culture. And, and isn't that the pressure that we all live in? We all live in a culture. Like your workplace has a culture. Do you know that? Your workplace has a soul. It has a mind, a will, and an emotion. But do you realize that also Elevate Church has a soul? This church has a way of thinking. This church has a way of feeling, right? And this church has a will of we'll go for it or we don't go for it. And so we have that. And so it says, so don't be well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even what? In other words, right now, you can be working in an environment and without even thinking, you're already normal. You look like them, talk like them. Your attitude is just like them. It hasn't changed. You're, 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 you're been, you've been shaped and you've been formed. And he says, instead, here's what you do. He says, 
Fix your attention on God. In other words, if you want to completely change, you got to put your eyes back on Jesus. If you honestly want to completely see a transformation, if you want to see a metamorphosis in your life, you must set your eyes back on God. He says, you'll be changed from the inside. Come on. You'll change from the inside out completely. God will change you. So many of us are trying to change from the outside in, but that ain't working. You got to change from inside and then the outside validates what you did on the inside. Readily recognize what he wants for you, from you. And quickly respond to it, unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity. He says, God brings the best out of you. Who brings the best out of you? God. God brings out the best out of you. He develops well-formed maturity in you. And so just to give a quick uh, uh, example of someone in the Bible who was well formed by God from the inside out was a man or he was a boy then, a boy by the name of Daniel. Do you guys remember Daniel? Okay, so Daniel was, was someone who was taken from his parents. He, he became a slave, and, and he was stolen from his family. And, and now there's this wicked king named Nebuchadnezzar who was just a chaotic, confused. One moment he's for God, the next moment he's not. He's just, he was influenced by all the wrong voices. And so now Daniel is a servant to this king, this, 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 uh, this, this realm and 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 he's he has the pressure of the culture of this kingdom think about it you and i if you if you're going through something you have a church that supports you there's a prayer team if you need prayer you can come get prayer at any single service okay if you need someone to encourage you if you need a message you get come you get inspired encouraged you get built up okay so just think so daniel is a loner He's surrounded by people that are norm. He's surrounded by people that are kiss butts to the king. He's surrounded with a lot of man pleasers. And Daniel is right here in this kingdom. He loves God and he's trying not to compromise. And he's trying not to fit in. He's trying not to look like them. As a matter of fact, if you start in Daniel chapter 1 from the very beginning, it says that even his eating habits were different from everybody else. So he was not wanting to, to eat from the delicacies of this world. But look at what happens here uh, in, in Daniel 5. Look at this. He says, now, the reason he was able to live different, be set apart, come on, the reason he was able to be exceptional was because an excellent spirit. Ever say excellent spirit. Because here's the deal, guys. If God Almighty lives in you, there should be an excellence about you. There has to be. He says the reason he was able to be set apart and not be formed and shaped by that culture was because an excellent spirit, look at this, an excellent knowledge and an excellent understanding was inside in him to interpret dreams, explain riddles, solve problems that were found in this Daniel. I love this thing. I love this. That Daniel... Uh, not, not only did he serve a crooked and wicked king, but he had the ability because of the excellent spirit in him to not be conformed to everybody else. You know what's another good, uh, uh, wonderful thing about this is that when you see Daniel's life, that he had an excellent spirit to not only be a problem. See, there, there's two kinds of people. There's the people that bring you problems, and then there's the people that solve problems. Even in that, he was an excellent spirit. Like, people are so great at bringing, you know, pastor, guess what? No, 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 there's no more toilet paper. Okay, well, then buy some. <laughs> yes or no? It's like your kids. Dad, there's like no more. And they, they have the ability to go to the supermarket, buy some stuff, and they're just telling you all the problems, right? But they don't know how to solve them. And so Daniel had this excellent spirit. I mean, if you want to have a spirit of Daniel, you have to begin to realize that the Holy Spirit lives in you. You have the spirit of wisdom. You have the spirit of revelation. You have the spirit of understanding. Come on, you have the spirit of solving problems. Instead of talking about your problems and this problem and that, you know what? Tap into the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, can you give me some wisdom in how to handle this? Can you give me a response? Can you give me a, a, a problem-solving anointing to handle this situation? And you watch what God will do. He'll give it to you. 
And so the reason that, that, that Daniel was, was favored by this king, and of course, it came with a lot of haters that didn't like him, but he had an exceptional, an exce- and how many know that Daniel served the same God we served? He serves the same God you and I serve, the same one you prayed to, the same one that Daniel prayed to. <laughs> and Daniel 6, verse 3 through 4 says this. He says, now Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators because now he's working the political realm and God kept promoting him and putting him over stuff. But look at this. And the satraps, now I know why they're called the satraps, right? Because they, they say they're going to be trapping him. By his, except, look at this, by his exceptional what? Qualities. That the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. In other words, he distinguished himself with exceptional qualities. Not by the way he fit in. Not by the way he partied with them because he didn't party with them. Uh, Not by kissing up to anyone. Not by being a man pleaser. Not by taking sides. But by his exceptional qualities that Daniel distinguished himself that the king said man there's something different about you everybody else is doing the norm but you are different Daniel let me give you another point Daniel's spirit of excellence made him exceptional Daniel's spirit of excellence is what made him exceptional Daniel could have been bitter because of all the hate think about it and they just kept trying to destroy him. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that the satraps were trying to find, and they went through all of his job, like everything he did as far as an employee of the king. And they were trying to find, let's see, does he show up on time? You know, is he always late? Does he take his lunch on time? You know, is he working? Is he finishing his projects on time? Like they looked, they literally dissected all of his job responsibilities, and they said, man, we can't find one thing against this dude. And then they said, ah, so the only place we'll get them is that we're going to have to come up with this fake God where everybody has to worship King Nebuchadnezzar. And if anyone does not kneel, they'll be thrown into the the den of lions. Well, guess what? We know that Daniel prayed how many times a day? Three. Three times a day. Think about it. Do you know how to get that exceptional spirit? By being in God's presence and by being in God's word. He prayed. He Listen. His, his pattern was prayer. Three times every day, he'd open the windows, and everybody look, and he would kneel and be like, God, help me to interpret whatever dreams the king has given me. What if you started praying like that about your workplace? But I'm not the owner. Who gives a rip? What if you worked like you were? I bet they'd promote you. I bet, they would, I, I bet you'd get a financial increase. I'm telling you, I've seen it. I've been there. Y'all think I've been a pastor all my life. No, I've worked in the workforce, and I have seen the blessing of God over my life because I distinguished myself from everybody else. And so Daniel prayed, Father, I pray that you would help me to be the greatest dream interpreter that the king needs me to be. What if you start praying, God, help me to be the best manager, the best leader. Help me to be the best employee that this company needs me to be. Father God, I pray that because I'm in this company, this company will be blessed. What if you started praying like that? God, I thank you that though I'm, I'm, I'm surrounded by haters, I thank you that you give me a spirit of love a spirit of grace, a spirit of mercy that when I get hated on, that I know how to bring a soft answer to ugly because soft answer will, t- will turn away wrath. Three times a day he prayed, Father, give me the capacity to keep expanding my, my wisdom, my understanding. That's why the king saw him and said, you're going to look over all my reign. You're going to reign over everything I own. Huh? He had every right to be bitter. Just like you probably have every right to be bitter, upset, angry, unforgiving towards someone you work with or your boss. But what separates you from everybody else? What's going to separate you? You can be upset all you want, but what separates you? Because an exceptional spirit thinks different, perceives different, talks different. He could have adapted to everybody's junk, 
but he didn't adapt. He didn't fit in. He stood out. And that's what God is saying to Elevate Church today. He says, I want you to be different. You be the one that works hard when nobody's working hard. You be the one that listens well when no one listens well. Do you realize that when you're a good listener, that's a spirit of excellence? When someone tells you to do something and you do it, that's a spirit of excellence. When you're fighting against what someone's asking you to do, that's, that's the normal. But a spirit of excellence knows how to serve. Do you realize that a spirit of excellence is teachable? How many teachable people do I have in the house that you're teachable? Any teachable people in this place? Huh? Any people flexible up in this place or are you all stiff? We're going to change this. Ah, we can't change. No. Listen, in Elevate Church, you better be flexible. You won't make it here. You be, I mean, you literally, you got, like, I can be right here and I'll change my message five minutes before the sermon. We're changing the sermon. What the, what do you mean you're changing the sermon? We're changing it all. What do you mean? Yeah, my last sermon sucked. We're going to change it. We're going to make it better. Like, we'll do stuff like that. Yeah, but we worked 10 hours on that video. I don't care. We're pulling the plug. We're pulling it. Why? Because the spirit of excellence is not, is not moved by change. A spirit of excellence is ready to serve. It's ready to, to bend forward or bend backwards. You're ready. You're, why? I'm teachable. I'm moldable. I'm shapeable. Man, God, do, with, do in me something special. Those are the people that God promotes. Those are the people that God elevates. Come on, flex. Go like this. Okay, we're done. Colossians 3.23, let's go. Whatever you do. Everybody say whatever you do. Okay, whatever. Everybody say whatever. Man, that means this, how you eat, how you drink, how you talk, how you serve, how you smile, how you love, how you teach, and whatever you do, work at it with all of your heart as working for who? The Lord. So when you go to work tomorrow morning, who do you work for? Let me say that again. Who do you work for? Do you work for that nasty boss? Do you work for that company? Who do you work for? See, you'll work different. You will. You'll show up with a better attitude when you, listen, I know you're going to show up with a bad attitude against God. Like, man, psh, why are we here? No, if you knew that you work for God, you, your attitude would change. You'd be like, good morning, Lord. Ready to serve you. He says, whatever your hands find to do, do it for God. Do it for the Lord, not for human masters. When you come to Elevate Church, you're not serving me. You're not serving my wife. You're not serving leaders. You're serving the Lord. Don't get an attitude. Amen? Let's do it unto Jesus. Amen? That's what we do. And when you do that, the spirit of excellence comes from within. Remember that. The spirit of excellence comes from within. And I'm not talking about methods of excellence because methods can be learned. But a spirit of excellence must be caught. If today's message impacted you in any way and you want to help us spread the gospel with a financial gift, text the number below. And we know that someone's life will be changed the same way that yours was today.